On the spot, National Film Board's up-to-the-minute report on what's going on somewhere in Canada. This week and every week, NFB camera crews are on the spot where things are happening, recording the varied and colorful life of Canadians. Tonight we invite you to join a film board crew with Fred Davis on another location. This is Fred Davis speaking to you from Korea. Your on-the-spot crew arrived here several days ago, having flown in from Tokyo's Tachikawa Airport. Since that time, we've been wandering around through various spots in this distant oriental country that have become household names at home. Places like the Imjin River, Gloucester Valley, the capital city of Seoul, and Panmunjom. Today, we're standing on a dockside at the famous port city of Incheon. The war front is quiet now. The armies are digging in, silently facing each other across a two-mile demarcation zone that lies some 25 miles north of here. But today's on-the-spot assignment doesn't concern itself with armies. As 1954 opens, we're faced with the realization that just fighting a war to a conclusion isn't enough. The Korean economy lies in ruins. And for us to simply turn our back on this grave problem and go home risks losing all we've been fighting for for the last three years. One of two major agencies that have been set up to deal with this problem is UNCRA. That's the United Nations Korean Reconstruction Agency. And with us today, we have from the agency Mr. Tim McClure and Mr. Milo Moore. And Tim, I wonder if you could tell me first uh, just what state you found the Korean economy in when you first arrived. Well, Fred, the destruction in Korea exceeds anything I've ever seen. Uh, more than half a million homes in Korea were laid waste, destroyed by shell fire and by simple fire. The farming industry has been seriously affected. Uh, hundreds and thousands of farmers were driven from their lands by the advancing forces. and. While they've been away, the irrigation works have fallen apart. Uh, hundreds of factories have been destroyed, and vital machinery has been uh, lost through enemy action. It's as bad as that. Well, um, I suppose your agency's job then is to pour money in to help out this reconstruction. Is that the idea? Well, I wouldn't exactly call it pouring money in. To be sure, we are spending millions of dollars in Korea, but we are doing our level best to see that that money goes in the most effective way. We spent many, many months studying the Korean economy and undertaking to see in what fields of economic endeavor we can most usefully spend the money that the United Nations has made available to us for the program. Now, uh, what, uh, from your research, would you say uh, are the industries that, that need the most help? Well, by all odds, if you take the number of people employed, the field of agriculture is certainly the most important. More than 70% of the population are farmers or people directly connected with farming. The second most important industry, without any question, is the fishing industry. Well, on the subject of fishing, uh, since we're here in a, in a coastal port, it's difficult for me to understand just how an industry can be depleted uh, to the extent you've described. Is there something I can see here that uh, would show me just what has happened to the fishing industry? Well, Fred, I think we ought to talk to Milo about that. He's our fisheries expert, you know. Fine, okay. Milo, I understand you can tell me just what is wrong with the Korean fishing fleets and the fishing industry as a whole. Well, the fishing fleet is badly deteriorated as a result of all the troubles the fishing industry has had. Well, what specifically were the troubles? Well, the fishing boats had deteriorated through a lack of supplies and marine engines, lumber and nets and other equipment to maintain their industry. They just didn't have the necessary tools to work with or the boats to fish in. Is that the idea? There just was no supplies to keep up their gear. Well, what about, um, 
these particular nets out here, Milo, I'm no fisherman, but they look to be in pretty fair shape. Would they be new ones? Those nets are probably uh, uh, gear that's been imported under the UNCRA program. Uh, nets that they've made up from the bales that we've imported here. So here's a tangible evidence, then, of the help that these people are receiving from uh, UNCRA. Is that so? Yes. Sometimes it's difficult to see what we have given them, but in, uh, in uh, the gear that they use to catch fish by cables, nets, lines, and other materials uh, make up their operation. So as I understand it, you people are providing lumber and fishing tackle and gear and supplies, and in some cases even boats to help get this particular industry back on its feet. Well, uh, Tim, uh, you told me a few moments ago about how important the agriculture program was to your reconstruction dealings here. Is there something I can see on that level? Well, yes, Fred. If you'd like, we could go now and see some of the work we're doing among the farmers. Fine, I'd like that very much. So now comes an important aspect of our Korean story, one that provides the backbone of the nation's economy, the Korean farmer. Eight out of every ten Koreans live off the land. Their way of life is a simple, frugal one, an endless round of toil. For fuel and warmth, he makes long treks to his country's eroded hills and there collects what branches he can find. His staple food is rice. This rice, the world's finest, he grows in paddies, or water-filled enclosures. The water comes from reservoirs up in the hills, and he carefully regulates the water level of each paddy by an ancient, intricate system of irrigation. Animals are scarce, so he uses human excrement as fertilizer. Every inch of soil is utilized. With the approach of winter, the same paddy doubles as a skating rink. Youthful Korean ingenuity makes up for the lack of skates as we know them. These little fellows propel themselves along by means of wooden poles with nails in the end as they skid along on their small wooden platforms and steel runners. During harvest time, the women folk of the villages help out in the fields. But right now, the harvest is in, so they've returned to their normal duties around the home. Here are a couple of interested bystanders. By the way, this method of transportation is the popular thing here in Korea. Now at last, Mommy here has time to sew. This particular dress she's working on is for another member of the family, who is going to be married shortly. Rice is one of the basic foods here in Korea. And here we see it being prepared for the evening meal. Well, here's our typical Korean village. And the farmers in this country live in uh, these clusters of houses, unlike the farmers back home who live in solitary dwellings out on the land itself. What's all that racket, Tim? Sounds like a pig, Fred. Let's go see, shall we? Well, this is part of our inoculation program, Fred. These men here are from the local veterinary lab. They're vaccinating these pigs with vaccines that we've provided. Well, what are they being inoculated against? Uh, in this case, it's hog cholera, Fred. Is that a serious problem here? Well, it's been a very serious problem in Korea. Uh, two years ago, they lost 43,000 hogs out of a population of less than a million. 43,000. Well, uh, haven't they tried to do anything about it? Well, 
They've come to expect this thing is more or less normal. But obviously this is more food than Korea can afford at this time, afford to lose. And we've tried to do something about it. And how successful has your program been for them? Well, we feel pretty good about that, Fred. Last year, there were less than 10 cases reported in South Korea. Well, you should feel good about that. That's a real achievement. <laughs> so far, we've been concerning ourselves with the reconstruction in terms of agriculture and industry. But there's another aspect, a very important aspect, which we should consider, the children of Korea. These are the faces of the children of Korea. They are not ordinary children. Their eyes have seen things which no child should have seen. Children don't think of war in terms of ideals or areas to be defended. They know only that once the noise is passed, they are hungry and cold with no one to protect them. In South Korea alone, it is estimated that there are between 60 and 80,000 such children, homeless, drifting from one ruin to another. In an effort to reclaim these children of war, the Koreans and representatives from other interested nations have set up a series of orphanages. I'm speaking to you now from the Myungjin orphanage in the city of Seoul. And the children that you see here are typical of the thousands and thousands of uncared for children that are still roaming the hills and surrounding countryside. Now we're going to meet some of them. These kiddies and those in other orphanages are the lucky ones. Outside, the cruel Siberian wind will soon sweep down across the hills and winter will come. The unlucky ones will shiver in mountain caves and the bombed out ruins of buildings. When spring comes around again, there won't be as many of them. A comforting thought is that these kitties at least will have food and shelter. Unfortunately, our visit to this distant land has been so short that we've only just begun to tell the Korean story. But if those of us who live comfortably thousands of miles away keep in mind what is happening here and also are aware of the needs of the reconstruction agencies, then each succeeding year may see a happier life for these peoples. Now this is Fred Davis saying goodbye to you from Korea and inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when the National Film Board will present another on-the-spot story. Thank <laughs> you.